passage this morning is from Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 50. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and brothers. For whoever who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So I want to give us a little bit of a context again as to where we are in this passage. We've been talking about the kingdom of God for a number of weeks, and now we're talking about the responses that people are giving to Jesus as he lays out what the kingdom of God is. And we've been here in chapter 12, and we've broken this, de- this passage down and simply to say that this kind of two-pronged apo- approach to the focus. First of all, we saw last week the cataloging of the responses of the Pharisees to Jesus. And it seems as if the, the more they see him, where they're listen, when they listen to him and they see what he's doing, the harder their hearts get, the more they reject until they come up with this kind of final rejection to the laying out of the kingdom gone. And this final no is we do, do not want this. This is the loudest they can possibly make their opposition. And this is what they say. It is only by Beelzebub, it is only by the prince of demons that this man drives out demons. The ultimate no is they attribute the work of God to Satan. And Jesus addresses that, and then we see their response of this constant hardening of heart. And it came, we said, in in the form of four different challenges. The first we looked at to last week, and then we want to kind of wrap this up today. The first response last week we said was this. In fact, you may look good on the outside. You may ha- look religiously appropriate on the outside, but the truth is, and he, here he's trying, making friends and neighbors, he says, you are a brood of vipers. You are not what you first appear to be. You are evil, and nothing good can come out of you. What you need is a new heart. And then second of all, there was the statement, you think of yourselves when you look at others as being morally superior, and what you really need is a new perspective. He brought that perspective by using two examples. First of all, he he talked about Jonah the prophet, who didn't even like the people of Nineveh that he was sent to. Jonah could care less if they repented, and he came with that heart. This kind of message says, okay, this is the message. He, He gives it. And lo and behold, they repent. And Jesus says, how much more on the final day will they stand in judgment of you because you were given so much more than they? And then he talks about the queen from the south. All she did was hear about someone who heard about someone who had wisdom, and she traveled this great distance to to learn uh, of this person. And Jesus says, and now here is someone who is so much wiser than Solomon and you rejected those two. As, he, as Jesus responds to their rejection of him, and then these two today that we're going to be taking a look at, simply this. You may have cleaned up your act. You may look good. You may have reformed, but what you need is a transformation. And then you may feel connected to spiritual things. You may think of yourself as someone spiritual, but what you really need is as a new family. So let's dive in and take a look at these last two. First of all, you, you may have cleaned up your act, but what you really need to do is, is be transformed. And with this, we are introduced to this sort of 
whole kind of demonology, this talk about, about demons. The, the methodology is, is all about when someone is demon-possessed, it, it, it's not about that, but he's not, Jesus is not giving kind of instructions on how to deal with demons, and the context kind of fleshes this out for us. He says this, that this evil spirit is looking for a place, the kind of place that the spirit looks for is this dry, arid, and empty place to find rest. And then Jesus also tells us that there's some kind of a hierarchy within this demonology. The, the original spirit leaves him, and, and when he comes back, he brings back seven spirits or even more evil than the original. But there are some things that we don't know from this passage. We don't know how this, this demon left. We only know that when he came back, that the person who had been infected was worse off than he was before the house had been swept clean and been placed in order. It had been redecorated. They had painted the walls. It was, it was cleaned up, but it was unoccupied. Some kind of reformation took place in this man. So let's, let's try to put this in a 21st century context. This guy comes into work, and his boss says, listen, you've been showing up late week after week after week, and now your job is in danger if you don't straighten out and get in here on time. Or maybe the guy got arrested for a DUI one night on his way home from work and after stopping at a bar. Or, or maybe it was his wife who said, you know what, I've had enough of you. If you do not change your behavior, your attitudes right now, this marriage is over. So, so whatever happened to this guy, he cleaned up his act. He put filters on his computer. He started showing up for work on time. He took the Jack Daniels. He flat flushed it down the toilet. He starts listening to focus on the family and Christian worship music on his way to work, on his way home. And we all know people like that. They're going through on this certain track and then comes to this crisis and maybe even a tragedy and they decide they've got to change. They've got to change their life. They have to clean up and get their stuff in order. And please, uh, what I want you to hear me say, it's not a bad thing to, to respond to crisis. It's foolish not to respond to crisis in your life. But there's something else going on here. And it's this, that if the change in your life is not born out of a conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life, if that change is not empowered by the Holy Spirit, then it's just an external thing. And there's no internal reality to, to what is going on. And if it's, it's not a ch if it's not a change of heart, if it's just a change of external things, of appearance, we're told that this ultimate cleaning out, redecorating of this, is of ultimately no eternal spiritual effect in a person's life. Now, this whole reformation is compounded by the fact that you get people around you, and when these people begin to see these changes taking place in your life, they are encouraging you to keep it up. And the key to understanding the basic problem that Jesus is addressing here is found in that little phrase, the house was unoccupied. They were not transformed by the indwelling, empowering of the Holy Spirit. They were reformed. They didn't enter into a relationship with God. They got religion. And not only is that dangerous enough, but then when we open ourselves up to this onslaught of the enemy, the person looks good on the outside, but is empty on the inside, and now they are in worse shape than they were before. They are in worse shape than the person whose life is falling apart and who knows that their life is falling apart and is open to confession and repentance and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells them, this is the consequence of this in verse 45. And then it goes and it brings its seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. The word dwell means to settle down, to occupy, to be at home, this spirit will be 
at home in this person's life. It is, it is the opposite, the antithesis of the condition of a person that Paul speaks about in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He says, I pray that according to the riches of the glory that he may grant you, strengthen and empower you with the spirit to your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you may be rooted and grounded in love. Instead of being unoccupied, we are occupied, overflowing with the indwelling at home presence of Jesus in our life. And if all we do is sweep clean the house, the evil one is going to settle down and be at home. And here Jesus is addressing the self-righteous religionist. It's not about adding another activity. It's about receiving a brand new heart. Back in, in Matthew 18, there's the story of the Gadarene demoniacs, and they were the quintessential example of people who are under satanic attack. It's kind of manifestation of body, mind, and spirit. There's no doubt what's going on. And when he arrived at the other side of the region, the Gadarenes from Matthew 8, two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs met him, and they were so violent that no one could pass their way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. And that was, that was pretty bad, but it was also pretty easy to identify kind of what's going on here. Here, we, what we have in this passage is even a worse scenario than that passage in Matthew chapter 8. Because the person looks great on the outside, he's mouthing the right words, he's active in the things we think he should be active in, he looks the part, manifesting religious activities. And I said, th this is not an easy or really a straightforward passage because of the, the, the church is kind of the biggest enabler in this whole reformation rather than transformation. The church, because of the, the constant pressure sometimes that we exert. You know, you are, a, you are a Christian. This is, should be your lifestyle now that you're a Christian. This is the way you should look. This is the way you should dress. This is the way you should, you should act. And so people are pressured to conform to us rather than being conformed in the image of Christ. And the church reinforces it because now they look like us. They have our jargon. They, they use our language. They dress like us. They participate in the things that we participate in, and they stop doing the things that, oh, we never, ever did. And as a result, there's an emptiness and a powerlessness. Great appearance, but when sin comes and when Satan attacks and sin will come and Satan will attack, there's no internal thing to withstand it and it crumble like an empty eggshell. And then what's our response typically? Well, did, did you hear what happened to so and so, they seem to be so in, doing so good. And now they're kind of right back to where they were. I, I guess just it wasn't real. The Apostle Peter talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. And he does it in the form of two proverbs. A dog returns to its own vomit and a sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. That's kind of really brief and graphic, but what he's saying is this. You, you can take a pig, and you can take them out of the sty, and you can wash them up, and you can put cologne on them, and it, that may be a bit of a, a stretch, a disturbing <laughs> stretch, but, but you, you put a jacket on it, you put a bow tie on them, and you, you bring them to church, and... The moment you turn your back, they're you know, right back to where they were before. Or you can take Fifi, uh, maybe even a more disturbing image. Um, and I apologize to those who have poodles named Fifi. But you, you, can, you can put a hat on her, and you can put a rhinestone earrings on her, and you can dress her up, and you can bring her to church. But you can, the moment you turn your back, you, you really don't want to see what she's doing. But she did what she did because she's a dog. And because a pig is still a pig. See, Christianity is not about outward adornments. 
It's about an inward reality. Even here, in these harsh words from Jesus, there is always being pointed back to a place of, of repentance. Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but on the inside you are full of greed and, and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, and the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. It is not about reformation. It's about God's transformation of our hearts from the inside out that he calls us. And then last, the, the second part, he says, you need a new family. <laughs> Jesus is in the middle of this powerful confrontation. The kingdom of God is being preached, and there is being manifestations of the kingdom going forward. And from the back of the room, you hear, excuse me, Jesus, your, your, your family is here. And it, at, again, at first, Jesus' response doesn't to be, seem to be very respectable, respectful. In, in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, we read this. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. And Jesus uses this occasion to say, listen, there's something, there's a priority here that even comes before your biological family, and that is doing the will of the Heavenly Father. Because it's a sign of relationship, of family, and relationship with him. Just, just because someone is physically connected to a family, it doesn't mean that there's a spiritual connection. Just because we are physically connected to a church, we may participate and have membership, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are connected on a spiritual level. We all have a physical father, but Jesus is saying here, you need to be connected to your heavenly father, and that takes the priority. You see, the Pharisees were physically connected to the synagogue. They were members. They, they served on the board. And Jesus is saying, no, this connection does not come through those things. This connection comes to your spiritual family this way, in verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. He says it here in, in John chapter 6, verse 29. And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. The will of our Heavenly Father is to acknowledge Jesus Christ, that is to believe in Jesus, and to become a follower of Jesus, and in doing so, enter his family. John chapter 1, verses 12 through, and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, but of the will of man, but of God. And then in, in, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 13, and this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and his life is in his Son, and I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. The gospel does not call us to try harder. It does call us to take a long, hard look in the mirror as to who we are. And as we do that, as we see ourselves reflected in that mirror to allow God to reveal truly what's going on in the inside of us when we are truly honest about the condition of our hearts, it's at that point we become open to change and transformation, to realize that our only hope in this desperate state is the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ in our life. The gospel is believed, we receive him, and the, the miracle of God is that he, he takes pigs and he transforms them into princes. And he transforms dogs into sons and daughters. 
And all we need to do for that transformation to take place is to ask. Matthew chapter 7, verses 11, 7 through 11. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, for it will be opened. A which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This morning, if you've yet to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to declare your intent to become a follower, I would invite you to do that. It's not something long and complicated that we have to communicate, but just our need for him, the forgiveness of our sins, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to live the kind of life that he calls us to. Or maybe this morning you've, you realize that maybe all I've been doing is just pretending, trying to look, present myself good on the outside, but inside I feel hollow. Maybe today is, is that day of, of transformation for you. And so as I pray, I invite you to pray with your own words as to what you desire God to do for you in, in your life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we've spent time in your word, with increasing clarity, it, it comes to us that you are truly after our hearts, the deepest recesses of our lives. And it's as you reach in, as we open ourselves to you, that that, that transformation takes place from the inside out. Father, in ways that we have been pretending, play, playing a role, trying to present something good to, to the world, Without an internal reality, we, we ask your forgiveness and we ask that you would come in. For those of us who, who this is all just brand new, this who Jesus is, this, this kingdom that he has presented, but yet something is, is ignited in our spirits that this is something that's been missing in my life. I pray that, that you would come into the lives of those who are seeking you, Lord God, as they invite you to begin a work that no man or woman can do to bring new life, transformed life, and a new heart. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table once again. I want to read this passage, a familiar passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul is writing to church in Corinth and reminding them of the attitude and the heart to which they are co to come to this table. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread or drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread or drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, you have chosen these simple elements, a crust of bread, 
cup of wine to draw us back to the reality of what Jesus Christ has done for us and the grace has, that has been poured out upon us because of him. It is our desire to come to this table and fully acknowledging our need for you and our gratitude for what you've done. Would you fill us anew with your spirit? Would you grant to us a deeper measure of faith as we come that we might see you more clearly? We ask all this through Christ who died for us and is risen again. Amen. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ broken for us. Let's eat together. The cup where once the cup was filled with the wrath of God, we have now been offered this cup of grace and of blessing. And we drink, thanking God for the forgiveness of sins that comes through the shedding of blood. We drink together. Amen. Lord God, would you bless the words that have been spoken, the worship we have entered into, that you would carry us forth as disciples of Jesus. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, Christ Chapel. And again, we hope that you have a wonderful week.